I want to share something uh, which I saw some time back and uh, I thought it was appropriate with the message I am going to preach this morning. This is about Dr. Robert Schuller. I don't know if any one of you all know Robert Schuller because in the early vintage, as pastor says, the 70s, he's one of the famous evangelical pastors, television evangelist. And uh, this is about his daughter. A teenage daughter of his met with a motorcycle accident and lost a leg and was in the hospital. And uh, John Wayne is also the same era, one of the famous American actors. He was a fan of Robert Suler, but never gave his life. He listened to the message like most of the people, not here, outside. They listened to the messages, but he never gave his life. He heard about this accident, and she, he was writing a letter to Cindy, the girl's name, some people call her Carol, Cindy. She was a teenager at that time. Dear Cindy, sorry to hear about your accident. Hope you will be all right. Signed, John Wayne. The note was delivered to her and she decided she wanted to write John Wayne a note in reply. She wrote, Dear Mr. Wayne, I got your note. Thanks for writing to me. I like you very much. I am going to be all right because Jesus is going to help me. Mr. Wayne, do you know Jesus? I'm sure you know Jesus, Mr. Wayne, because he listened to the messages. Because I cannot imagine heaven being complete without John Wayne being there. I hope if you don't know Jesus, that you will give your heart to Jesus right now. See you in heaven. And she signed her name. She was, she was written this one and put it in the envelope. She's in the hospital bed. She's in pain. She's not comfortable. She didn't go for a holiday to the hospital. She was in pain. And she kept it in that envelope. And across the envelope here written Mr. John Wayne. When a visitor came in to her room to see her, he said to her, what are you doing, girl? She had just put, the, uh, she had just said, I wrote a letter to John Wayne, but I don't know how to get it to him. He said, that's funny. I am going to have dinner with John Wayne tonight at the Newport Club down at Newport Beach. Give it to me and I will give it to him. She gave him the letter and he put it in his coat pocket. So there was a, they all went for the dinner. These guys, there were 12 of them that night sitting around the table for dinner. They were laughing and cutting up and the guy happened to reach in his pocket and realize there was a letter and he was trying to give it to him. John Wayne was seated on the other side at the end of the table. And the guy took the letter out and said, hey, Duke, Duke is a pet name or nickname for John Wayne. I was in Shula's daughter's room today and she wrote you a letter and wanted me to give it to you. Here it is. They passed it down to John Wayne and he opened it. They kept on laughing because they were having a good time having drinks and all these things. And someone intently looked at John Wayne. He was crying. One of them said, hey, Duke, what's the matter? He said, can I read you this letter? He read the letter to them. Then he began to weep again. He folded it and put it in his pocket. And he pointed to the man who delivered to him and said, you go and tell that little girl right now in this restaurant, right there, John Wayne gives his heart to Jesus Christ and I will see her in heaven. Three weeks later, John Wayne died. You never know how your witness to another will affect their eternity. At 
times with our own struggles which deters us from ministering the grace and mercy of our savior lord this little girl cindy was at the most painful time of her life penned a few lines from the hospital bed propelled act john wayne to eternity at the last cups of his breath so one word one letter can change the life of somebody so without taking my time this morning the title of my small message is our witness could impact someone's eternity let us look at x3 1 to 10 one day peter and john were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called beautiful when he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts when he saw peter and john about to enter he asked them for money peter looked straight at him as did john then peter said look at us so the man gave them his attention expecting to get something from them then peter said silver and gold i do not have but what i do have i give you in the name of jesus christ of nazareth walk take him by the right hand he helped him up instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong he jumped to his feet and began to walk then he went with them into the temple courts walking and jumping and praising god when all the people saw him walk walking and praising god they recognized him as the same man who used to sit at the entrance and begging at the temple gate called beautiful and they were all filled with wonder amazement at what had happened this was a story of a miracle it's a, i think uh, this lame man was uh, at the entrance of the temple for scripture says he was about 40 years 40 years he was there at the temple he was begging because he's lame he cannot do because during that cultural thing i mean because due, due, due to the mosaic law they can't, they can't go into the temple so he was but then god showed up when he was 40 in the form of apostle peter and apostle john and this was the time in the church i mean the new church was beginning because if you look at uh, acts 243 and peter preached a great sermon and 3000 people were added to uh, on the pentecost day so this was the most exciting day and peter's was miracle but remember 40 years it took for this man to be healed sometimes we expect answers overnight we want to answer straight away we can't we find it difficult to even wait for 4 hours because we are living in times we want answers for everything but here this man has lived for 40 years so the first thing i want to talk is god directs our path at the right time to touch lives god directs our path at the right time to touch lives verse 1 and 2 says one day peter and john were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple called gate called beautiful when he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts if god wants to use you and me to touch lives you and i should have an intimate relationship with god the key to intimate relationship is your prayer life and my prayer life here we see peter and john was going up to the temple at 3 in the afternoon some translations say the hour of prayer the ninth hour Jews observe prayers three times a day morning that's third hour mid afternoon that's the ninth hour and sunset i don't want to put more emphasis on this prayer at this moment but prayer is critical in my life and your life that's why pastor andrew always says we on a sun monday to come for prayer it's not for his benefits he wants us to develop because our solutions for our challenges and our struggles is in prayers i have a friend of mine 
who lives in Cofield in front of a synagogue. He was an ordinary Christian. And he has found, most of his customers were these Jews. Because if you see across the spectrum of the world, Jews are doing very well. They are extraordinarily rich and I mean, they are blessed with everything. Nobody knows the key to their fruitfulness is prayer. So this man was there and he has seen and they invited him into the synagogue. He started going and he was flourishing. So prayer plays an integral part in my life and your life. The ninth hour here, ninth hour indicates that's in the afternoon, is biblically significant time of the day. Ninth hour is the time Jesus died. And that was the time the curtain torn in two. We have an access today to the Holy, Go Holy God because of that happened. You don't need to, like in the Old Testament time, go through a priest, you can go straight. It was all the, the ninth hour was the time the angel appeared to Cornelius and told him his prayers have been heard. Cornelius was a centurion. He was, he was a devout, uh, he was a uh, righteous person, but he was not closer to Jesus. But on the ninth hour, with Peter anointing, he became a Christian. And ninth hour is the time here you see Peter and John healing this lame man. Peter denied God three times. But yet God used him. This illustrates in spite of my failure and your failure, God will use me and you to bless others. We see in this scripture, the lame man was carried to the temple every day and left at the entrance to beg from the people who were entering the temple. This was the only occasion the lame man was seeing Peter and John. It is worth noting Peter and John were going to the temple for a long time, not once but thrice. He has been going in and out of the temple. Probably the lame man would have been there. We don't know what happened. Nobody has seen him. Surely there would have been more opportunities for Peter and John to see this lame man. But this was the only occasion the lame man was encountering Peter and John. This is called God's timing. This is called God's timing. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has made everything beautiful in his time. We often expect an immediate response from God for our prayers, but God is telling us to be patient. The scripture also states that the lame man in the scripture, you say, saw Peter and John as they were entering. The word that is rendered saw implies an embracing perception. What is that? This means the lame man had seen something different in them. Because everybody was giving money, he was just casually taking it. But he has seen something different in them. From the others who entered the temple. When God, sends one, some, when God sends someone across your path and my path, he has already prepared his or her heart to receive from you. If nothing happens in an accident. God prepares the heart of that man for Peter and John to minister to him. When we walk in the presence of God, others can see something different in us. Two weeks ago, I was uh, away in interstate. Everybody asked me whether I'm here or not. And when they see me, they said, oh, like, good to see you. So, so but the reason I was there, of course, you all know my children are there. So I used to speak to this person often. And uh, he was a lonely man. He had many challenges. He was uh, too exact. He was single. But I speak to him and he rings me. Sometimes I don't want to take the call from him. He rings me so much. He said, ah, how are you? He's a Hindu. So uh, I, I thought I must be wasting my time. So he said, whenever you come, drop in. So I said, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, you keep postponing. So this particular day, uh, particular week, I was ringing him. And he said, oh, come, come. 
And then one day in the morning, he rang me and told me, uh, I know you are trying to come, don't come. He is a guy who wants me to come all the time. And suddenly he is telling me, not to, early morning he is ringing me. He knew what? So I was seated. God was telling me something. So I was seated in front of my youngest daughter. He said, Dad, what are you? You are confused. I said, uh, no, I am thinking whether if you think, if God is prompting you, go now. I said, definitely not Claude. This could be God. Immediately, I told her, and I want to leave my wife and go. You know, very seldom I leave my wife and go because she is the anointed person. I am just there. She, so, I told my daughter, I think mama hasn't got up yet because I'm an early riser and my wife takes it easy. So, he said, anyway, tell her and go because otherwise you'll be in trouble, we'll be in trouble. You won't be able to come back here. You might have to take the car and go straight to Melbourne. So I told her, yeah, I'm coming. So I thought, satisfy her, drive her with uh, me, leave her at the entrance. I thought, I'll go. So I was driving, I said, uh, I'll go and see and come. No, 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 what's wrong with me? I'm coming. So pastor said yesterday, last time, you, know, you got to marry, you got to be very careful. So, so I took her and went. I saw him outside open and he said Shan I think there is a God you know what he said I have decided to finish my life if I wouldn't have said, that's what I told you not to come you said yes yes other probably illnesses and things like that he had something there and he said if you wouldn't have turned up you wouldn't have not seen me you know, nothing happened by accident. God has already predetermined. You know, it was not the easiest time for me. Early morning, to, if somebody is giving some money, I would have gone in the morning. But to go and pray to somebody driving about 35 minutes is not easy. And we sat with him. And, and the funny thing was, I was talking to him. My wife took over and she was talking and telling some home truths about life and eternity and all these things. He was nodding in this, I think good thing your wife came. She is really telling me what to do. I thought, hang on. I took all the pain to go there. Who gets the credit? My dear wife got the credit. But of course, I would have said the things what she said. She told us straight. She addressed something. Sometimes you have to minister, sometimes you have to address. So, when we walk in the presence of God, others can see something different in us. Our lifestyle and conduct should portray Christ in us. Because he know, I was a Hindu because we were classmates. Not, I know him for four or five years. I know him for 60 years. You can work out my age at this time. 60 years I know him. This is my classmate of mine. And he'd seen me and he has heard that. He said, every time he tells me, there's a reason God has done it that I can see you in Shan. Some of my Hindu friends recognize us and they are marveled at what God has done. Sometimes within our own community, sometimes I find it difficult others to recognize what you are doing in life. But I do it for God in any case. Because God has done so many things in my life, I will do it till, it, till I see him face to face. In 1 Timothy 4.12, Apostle Paul says, to the young Timothy, he's just coming into ministry. And this is for some of you young people. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith and purity. The second thing I want to talk is. God uses people who are willing to be interrupted. If God wants to use you and me. Are you willing to be interrupted? We are always busy. Busy for what? When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them money. Acts 3, 3 to 5. Peter looked straight at him and did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him attention, expecting to get something from them. 
let us picture this for a moment peter and john about to enter the temple to pray and all of a sudden this helpless man begins to cry out to them basically peter and john were interrupted and it is at this very moment the helpless man enters their life both peter and john look straight at him and then peter responded by saying look at us why do you think both peter and john look straight at him peter and john told them look at us why is that peter and john did not want to know about his condition not his background but only had compassion in that man we often go to minister to people and we knew want to know the a to z of their life the other day i got a call from somebody not from this church and he said can you pray because i have got a challenge but please see that you don't tell x y z you all christians then peter said in the verse look at us the earlier one they said they looked straight at him now they said look at us here peter and john want to draw the attention of this man to tell him that they are very much different to the other people who gave him money peter and john telling the lame man that they are the servants of the most high god and have been empowered by the spirit of god to bring healing and wholeness in jesus name in john 14 and 12 jesus was telling philip very truly i tell you whoever believes in me will do the works i have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because i am going to the father the scripture also says that this man, lame man was expecting to get something from them he was expecting something greater than the money because if peter and john had the money they would have given him straight away and they wouldn't have even entered into a conversation with this lame man what does this talk to you and me today if you want god to do something in your life and my life we must come with an expectant heart you come to the house of god expecting god to do something in your life if you come for prayers come expecting god to answer your prayers it is always a two way communication between you and god a lot of people go to church not here outside just to mark attendance they don't come with an expectant heart they go there to see who is coming we can it's a small catch up thing like that not here some fellowship they go but you go somewhere you go to the bank expecting a loan to be passed you go to the doctor expecting doctor to give you medicine to be healed well how come you come to a church not expecting god to do something come with an expectant heart you walk into this uh, you know when i come here i am in the presence of god presence of god i say god what do you want me to tell you should be honor and privilege to be in this place you must be honor and privilege to see these two people worked hard to build a church here we are able to come and congregate in a place here ministering i mean listen uh, receiving god's word here in my life and your life you are caught up in day to day activities and as a result we tend to overlook overlook the pressing need of others who come into contact with us on a daily basis sometimes we look at the enormity of the challenge and the sheer weight of the need tend to bypass that god given opportunity you know if somebody wants you to pray we are ready to pray over the phone if they say somebody is struggling can you come and see me we tend to give an excuse why we are busy we can do the surface level things we don't want to go beyond that to do things why this church was i'm not telling build because these two people went out of the way 
to touch lives. That's why we are here. I remember a couple of years ago, I had to go somewhere on the following day. I got a call around 10 o'clock and uh, that person sort of, I know him for a long considerable period and he told me, he rang me and he said, all right, what can I do for you? He said, can I come to your place tomorrow? I want to discuss something. And I said, because I had something the following day and I said, uh, I was about to ask him, can you come another day? But he said, uh, I want to really see you. So I said, fine. I told him, come. And then only went and told my wife. Because sometimes it's good to get your wife's permission to tell her. But then anyway, I, I knew it was, God is in it. So I went and told her. And then she said, you have made an appointment to do these things. I said, no. Let us put that to a side. We were disturbed. But God is in it. And I thought, he was not a believer. He came. I thought, just pray. One hour finish. Job finished. But God is mysterious. God is a funny person. I journeyed with him not one week, two weeks, for two years. And finally, I ended up witnessing to him at the, at the magistrate court, at the county court. And that was not the end of it. On the final day of the judgment, when the jurors got together, the solicitor and uh, um, advocate or barrister came and told me, we had done our part and the solicitor is known to me and he said, only your God can do a miracle here. To that extent, we made an impact. And when I gave witness at the witness box and I came down and then after that the jurors got together and they took oaths on the Bible. Don is here, he knows about it. So, so everybody stood out and read something but the head of the jury took the Bible in hand and took the oath. I came and told my wife I can see something special here. I think, you know, he would have been behind bars for the rest of his life. But when the judgment, when the verdict came, he was exonerated. And that's not the day he came and fell on my evils. I can't tell you what it is. You know, we were disturbed. He's not a Christian now. But still he's with me and he asked me for prayers every day. God will determine the time to touch him. But we have planted the seed. That's what we are. You know, we don't expect immediate answers and the results and things like that. That's what we want. We want prayer and we say, no, how everything is all right. Okay. Some of these struggles, it will take ages. This man was 40 years before God touched his life, that lame man. You know the story in Luke 10, 20, 32, 33, 30 to 35? There was a journeyman who was going from Jerusalem to Jericho and he was robbed and he was put into a side. There was a priest went, there's a Levite went. He looked the other way and went because his job was to pray. I think he would have prayed and gone because he didn't want to know about it. But the Samaritan went that way. Not only picked this fellow on the donkey, took him to the inn, paid him and all three were interrupted to a religious people. Two are Christians. One non-Christian helped him out. That's the life we are leading. We are in the church. We are in the church. We come for prayers. We come and say we are doing everything to others. We are going to church. But outside what you and I are doing. God is speaking to you all this morning. You better examine your heart as much as I examine my heart. Jesus was interrupted almost Everywhere he went during his time in his ministry, which was a short spell of three years, and he was interrupted. There's a story in Mark 2, you know it. There was a, a paralyzed man, he was carried. The, Jesus was at a meeting in Capernaum, and the house was full, the entrance was full, but these fellows found him 
and some of them hammered the roof or something like that, lowered him. And not only Jesus at the time, he was at a meeting, but he looked at him, he has forgiven, not only healed him, he's forgiven his sin. Here we see something profound that you and I can take from, from Jesus' ministry. Jesus not only met the paralyzed man's physical need, but also paralyzed man's spiritual need, which is a gateway to someone's eternal life. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Our witness should prompt others to lead an eternally focused life. Our witness is not just praying for them. It should lead them to an eternally focused because we are not going to be forever. You are here today, you are not gone tomorrow. So we need to help them, journey with them, carry them so that their goal, their aim is an eternally focused life. When we visited our friend there, the friend in Canberra, I said, my wife immediately said, uh, read the Bible, I will get your Bible. And he said, we have got a Bible here. I have read the Bible here and there. So something told me, God has already planned it. God, as I told you earlier, God has already laid the foundation. I don't have time to... Somebody has already given the Bible to him. 1 Corinthians 3.6, Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has making it to grow. This talks about the pioneering work of Paul, which was well supported and encouraged by co-workers Apollos. But ultimately, God is the architect and nucleus of our growth. In short, it is God's plantation and we are his workmen. We are just here as workmen. And finally, God entrusted us with varied gifts to glorify him. Ephesians 3, 7, Apostle Paul says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. And in Romans 12, 6, he says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us. God has called each and every one of us to be an instrument in his hands to touch lives. It is very important that we discern, each and every one of us, our individual gifting and talents. In my own life, God called me to minister to those who are hurting, wounded, and living in darkness like me before I encountered God. Often I hear people telling me, I am not gifted. I don't have this gifting to go and pray. But Jesus never had the luxury of all these gifted. His his disciples were fisher, fishermen and tax collectors. He never had any qualified accountant or a doctor to go and minister. We are the only one God is going to use for the extension of his kingdom. Today he's talking to all of us. Not to wait until we get everything right. Every one of us, including those who are watching on live stream, you have something in you which God can draw out to glorify him. The only criteria is to avail yourself. Are you available? And seek God's guidance for your life. Acts 3.6 says, Peter said to the lame man, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet, began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. The lame man was receiving money from others up until this point. But Peter and John gave him something greater. This is, that is the physical healing and wholeness of life. The lame man wanted was money, but he really needed was a touch from Jesus. 
It is also interesting to note that Peter and John had nothing material to offer. They didn't have anything money to give, but they had to give what they have. But they have reached into the spiritual reservoir to bless the lame man. Right hand, as Pastor Andrew says, right hand is symbolic of blessing, strength, and authority. Right hand is where God is seated. Right hand is mentioned about 166 times in the Bible. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. Peter, by touching and helping him, he is culturally resurrecting the lame man's life. By no means, this was not an easy act for Peter, but the Spirit of God prompted him to help him out at the lame man. Peter has prejudices. Later on, he said, So God was using Peter to touch lives. God often tests us in this aspect. We all love to minister to people whom we are comfortable with, but not to the downtrodden people who are socially handicapped. We like to go and say, yeah, somebody rings or go and pray. Someone like my friend, we don't want to go. You will be thinking about it. But God will test us time and again to see where your heart is. It is often time like this in our lives that God wants to reach out to bless others with his empowering bestowed on us. We all have our stories and our own transformed lives are great testimonies to touch lives. 2 Kings 5, you have a story, a Syrian commander, Naaman. He had leprosy. There was no cure for leprosy those days. He had a maid at home. She was, was a captive from Israel. And this maid told Naaman's wife, if my master go to the next side, that is Israel, and see prophet Elisha, there's a healing for him. And Naaman listened to that little girl who was a captive and went across and he was healed. He dipped in Jordan seven times, the number seven is completion. You know, not only that, Naaman gave his life to the God of Israel. You know, that little girl had faith. The little girl had her own challenges. She was locked up. She was taken away from their parents and locked up in Naaman's house and working as a maid. But she felt that was, you know, look at that uh, uh, girl, Cindy. She had own challenges, but yet she was able to minister. How much more we should do? Hudson Taylor, the great English missionary, his life motto was this, attempt great things for God and expect great things for God. We only look for small things. I mean, I just wanted to uh, say this because uh, uh, I have said some time back also. You know, in 2009, a conjoined twins, Krishna and Krishna, they were in an orphanage run by Mother Teresa's people and they were lying there. Because what happened in Bangladesh uh, they are orphans. There are people who cannot handle their kids. They come, so many kids can come and live there. there. And there's no cure. Conjoined twins means they were both twins attached on the neck. It's not an easy operation. You can't do it in Bangladesh. It costs you money. But there was a voluntary worker, Daniela Noble. She was a voluntary worker. She was just doing voluntary work with all the kids there. She felt pity for this girl. What did she do? She just took a call and rang an humanitarian worker in Melbourne, Moira Kelly. And that resulted in those two girls who flown by special flight and doctors had a surgery for 32 hours involving 16 surgeons. And today, the girls are living with Boyra Kelly, 12 years with the mother. What, have, what, did she, what did she have? She had any spiritual this thing? She had money? She had influence? Contact? No. One phone call. One of your phone call 
can lift somebody up. One of you act. Giving one foot to somebody can help you out. Do you know what you have in you? You don't need all the spiritual giftings. You don't need to carry the Bible. You have something in you. You discern that. As much as I discern, you have something in it. God will hold us accountable. Because living in times, we don't know we are, in, we are going to be next. Acts 3 8 says, The lame man went along with Peter and John into the temple courts. Peter and John did not want to leave him alone. Because the lame man was going to the temple courts for the first time in 40 years. The scripture says the lame man was 40. They did not want this man to be intimidated by the so-called religious righteous people because he was socially outcast because of the infirmity. According to Moses, if, if you have lameness and all these things, you are an outcast. So he is not allowed to enter into the temple premises. So the first time in 40 years he's going there. So other people say, hey, hey, you can't come in. They must be thinking he still has lame. Sometimes some outsiders come to the temple. He said, who? Oh, church, how come they come in? I have seen them doing something else outside. They can't come in. That's how they look at it. But we needed to, we needed to someone to stand alongside of them. That's why he went with Peter and John. Let me pray and finish it off. Loving, gracious Father, Almighty God. Father, your hand is upon your son at the moment. Father, I pray that you are hand to lift him up at this very moment. Father, you are a God of healed thee. With the stripes we are healed. I pray you bring healing, wholeness into his life. Commit him today. Father, we pray for every one of who are gathered here. Your hand to be with them. Challenges are part of our life. And Father, you have rallied through us. And we know God, even in this very moment, that man was healed after 40 years. And nothing is impossible with you, God, today. And today, in the name of Jesus, I pray, I commanded healing in the name of Jesus, not only for him, but everyone who across who need a touch, I commit them, Father, you will come through and your name to be glorified. Continue to minister your grace and mercy. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.